This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. The work I'm going to talk about today um, is, a, is at Georgetown University, it's highly collaborative. The dyslexia work I'm going to talk about is in collaboration with my colleague Lynn Flower, Flowers and Frank Wood at Wake Forest University. And uh, I'm not going to talk about it today, but we also do some collaborative work with Gallaudet University, which is a university for deaf students in Washington, D.C. And today I'm going to talk about reading. And uh, it's probably uh, obvious to most of you, but of course reading is tremendously important because it is the, the gateway to learning. And children who learn well, uh, who read well, read more often and, and have therefore the ability to learn more through print. And it, it's not just reading English, but of course it's access to all areas of knowledge and that's why it's so important. The thing that makes reading so special is that it is a purely cultural invention. And so when we think about reading, we have to remember that this is, this is something that's come to us very recently. Uh, language has been around for hundreds of thousands of years, whereas reading has just been with us for four to 6,000 years, as shown here on, as evidence on these early images from the logographic writing system in Asia and the alphabetic writing system found um, just west of the Nile, the early indication of, of written symbolic representation. And so, of course, we don't have animal models to study reading. And uh, uh, so when brain imaging came along, of course, that was a tremendous boost for understanding of the reading brain. And here's just a, an example of but when the, the very first imaging study looking at people reading inside the scanner. Uh, this was PET, and you can see the visual cortex lighting up. Of course, these days we have better images, uh, many through the magnetic resonance imaging te technology that we use. And here's our scanner before it was dropped into the imaging center. And of course, these have popped up all over the country, uh, literally falling out of the sky, as this one uh, from a crane, uh, and being put into research facilities so that we can study skills uh, such as reading and begin to get a good understanding of the areas that are involved in the reading brain. And of course, what's especially important to understanding the reading brain is to be able to scan children, and which is what uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging allows us to do, to non-invasively get at the, the um, neural signature for reading in children, but also track it over time and scan children at a young age and try and figure out what it is that we use in our brains to become a skilled reader. And what I'm going to talk about today are two kinds of uh, MRI data. There are, there are many more. But I'm going to show you um, studies that we've done to try and evaluate brain anatomy using MRI technology and also brain function. Uh, and particularly, of course, brain function, because we're interested in understanding how the brain is organized for reading. But as you will see during my talk, uh, learning to read doesn't just change how the brain is organized for reading, but it also changes the anatomy of the brain. And I always tell this to teachers, uh, that I remind them that when you teach children to learn to read, you are truly changing their brain. Um, and so these are the two kinds of technologies we're using. The thing where this research has really benefited from is that we are using imaging in the context of a very rich uh, field. Uh, people have done extensive research into reading, and we have a lot of understanding of why does children succeed with reading. We know, for example, that uh, there are certain skills that if children have those, they go on to be good readers, such as the alphabetic principle and phonological awareness, and I'll explain these as I go through my talk background knowledge, vocabulary, having good understanding of words, having many words in your vocabulary, understanding of sentence structure. These are all things that set up children uh, for success for reading. But we also know that the acquisition of reading changes depending, differs for ch different children depending on certain things, such as the language in which you're learning to read. Uh, some languages, the, the mapping between sound and print is very direct. Uh, so for example, in German, there's a very direct mapping. The, the, the letters always have the same sound. But of course, English is a harder language in which to learn to read because we have so many exception words. 
the orthography, different writing systems, um, and if you have to think about the idea that the brain is organized for reading, it is probably moonlighting somewhat. It's doing a task that it wasn't directly designed to do, and as we ask our children to become skilled readers in these different writing systems, they probably draw on slightly different brain areas in order to become uh, skilled at that task. And we also know that other things such as social class and sex and all these things um, influence the rate of reading acquisition in children. Now, reading involves um, certain skills. Uh, we often talk about uh, three concepts that are important for reading, so I want to explain them to you now, which is understanding how there are patterns in words, um, the spelling patterns or the visual word form, and that's often referred to as the orthography within words. And we, we map that onto the sound structure that we hear in words, which is the phonology. And when we read, we, we look at the orthography, we access the phonology, but we also have to access the, the meaning or the semantics. And of course, that is the, the reason for reading, is so that we can access meaning. And all of these um, are skills that we um, house in different parts of our brain, but sometimes in similar areas of the brain. And people have been studying for a long time, and, and it's uh, their key aspects of learning to read. And even though we think of them as separate, it's also known that they somewhat hang together. Uh, people have studied them, for example, using computational models, and have found that there are networks, there seem to be networks that work together to, to bring this information about reading, uh, the sound structure, the word form, and its meaning uh, to bear so that we can actually make sense of what it is that we learn, uh, that we read. Now, as I said, we, we know a lot about reading and a lot about reading development. So for example, Linnea Airy uh, some time ago described stages or phases of reading. So when you look at young children who are beginning readers, you can see that they have certain skills that get better and better and uh, are the phases that they have to go through to become a skilled reader. So for example, children, young children, kindergartners recognize certain letters that are common in our environment, like the, the yellow M sign for McDonald's, because we have a lot of exposure to that, they recognize that often, or perhaps the stop sign on the street that you see a lot, that you stop at all the time. So they begin to recognize certain frequent letters in their environment, and they begin to understand that letters have a sound that goes with them. And then, as they become more skilled, they understand that, that uh, the principles of decoding, and decoding is really sounding out words. And they also begin to understand that certain letter combinations exist again and again in our language, uh, and they can read those by analogy as soon as they get a hang uh, of understanding that they repeat uh, in the language. And so there are these stages that occur in early readers, and a little earlier than the children that we have been scanning. Uh, but we also know that there are skills that, if you have those skills, you are more likely to succeed in becoming a good reader than if you don't have those skills. And those skills have been described uh, under this umbrella term of phonological processing, but there, um, there are specific skills under that umbrella, umbrella term that I'm going to introduce you to. But the bottom line is, is that there are certain um, aspects about children's understanding or uh, sensitivity to the sound structure of our language that if they recognize that our spoken language is made up of units of sounds, that then helps them later on to map those units of sounds onto their symbolic representation, i.e. onto the written counterpart of those words. And so one of the first questions we set out to do is, is ask the question, how, how does reading, uh, what is the neural signature for reading in the brain of children who are typical readers? And what is the relationship between the brain areas that they use for reading uh, and the age at which they are, and also the relationship with their phonological skills that we know are so uh, important to producing a skilled reader? And so before I do that, I would just want to introduce you to the areas in the brain that I'm going to be talking about today. And you'll, you'll get fairly used to them by the end of my talk. Um, and these are areas that we've known for some time that are involved in reading. Uh, so they're the areas that we focus on even though we, we scan the entire brain. And they also map very nicely on models that have been put forward by people like Ken Pugh that talk about areas that we use for reading and, and how these areas may differ in children who struggle in learning to read, children with dyslexia.
And so the first area I just want to mention is this region here, which is at the intersection of the occipital and temporal lobe. It's often referred to as the visual word form area because it plays a role in recognizing words that we see very often in our environment. So the words that we don't sound out, like words like the and and that we commonly encounter, seem to be processed very rapidly by this part of the brain, giving us direct access uh, to its meaning. When we come across a word that we've never seen before and we have to actually sound it out and apply sound correspondence rules, we see engagement in the area here at the top of the temporal lobe and the inferior parietal cortex. And so it's referred to as an area that's involved in phonological assembly. It's putting together the sounds of that word. And the same area also seems to be involved in access to meaning of those words or semantic um, representation. And then in the front of the brain, in the inferior frontal gyrus, there seems to be, uh, again, that dual role for both phonological assembly and semantics, and slightly different parts of that uh, area, but again, uh, meaning and uh, assembly. So when we study children in the scanner uh, when they're reading, we have to, um, of course, be cognizant of the fact that they are novice readers, and we have to give them tasks that they can actually do in the scanner. And so one way we do that is by sort of um, tricking the brain a little bit with, with using a, a, um, a mechanism that's sort of interesting, which is this. So let me just demonstrate to you how this works. I'm going to show you a sentence on the screen, and I want you to look at it and tell me how many words are in the sentence. But I don't actually want you to read the sentence, OK? So I'm asking you, don't read the sentence. Just tell me how many words. And here you go, uh, you, you, most of you are skilled readers, and, and as you read, you cannot inhibit yourself from accessing the meaning. It's impossible to dissociate those two things. And this is actually what's behind the Stroop effect. And this is something that scientists have used to the advantage of reading studies, which is that if you show a person a word, they automatically not only look at the word form, but they access its phonological or sound representation and its meaning, like you just did, even though I told you not to do that. And, and and this is the, the, the principle that Kathy Price developed a task on that she used and then we have used for many uh, of the studies because we thought it was such a nice uh, 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 paradigm to use, where we ask people to look at words inside the scanner and tell us if the word they're looking at has a tall feature, like the L here, or not. And depending on if there is one, you press one button, and if there isn't, you press the other button. And then we take those scans um, that we acquire when people are doing this on a, a different word. Every few seconds, we show a different word. And we compare it to a task where you're also determining if there's a tall feature, yes or no. But this time, we're presenting you again with visual symbols, but they have no meaning, and they don't have a, sound, a, a corresponding sound because they're pseudo fonts. And what Kathy Price showed is that when you subtract the real words from the pseudo fonts, even though you're not reading aloud inside the scanner, you, you can see activity in the brain areas that we typically see during a loud reading. And we don't like people reading loud in the scanner because it also induces head motion and other artifacts. And so this is the task that we've used for many studies, and we use it here in a case to study children uh, starting at age six all the way to young uh, college students at Georgetown to ask the question, when they all do this task, what do we see across the brain, and how does it change? This is a cross-sectional study. It was done by my then uh, student, Peter Tuckeltaub, who's uh, now at Georgetown on the Faculty of Neurology. And what we found is that the earliest readers, they use the, this region here in the superior temporal sulcus. And this is an area that has neurons that code for information from both vision and audition, and particularly sensitive to um, sensory information from more than one modality. So it seems like a good choice for the reading brain to pick those areas that can code for both the visual information that obviously we need for reading and bring it together with the auditory information. And that, that we see that in the children between six and nine. And then when we go to slightly older children up to young adults, nine to 18 year olds, we begin to see activity here in the inferior parietal lobe and in the inferior frontal lobe. And then in our college students, you see what's sort of considered the, neural, the typical neural signature for reading, engaging all of these areas. And then what we did next is we asked the question, well, how does this signal that we get in these brain areas correlate with the person's skills measured on standardized tests outside of the MRI machine? And we went to three measures of phonological processing. And so um, what we're interested here is really tapping into primarily this skill, which is phonemic awareness, which is a person's ability to isolate and manipulate the sounds that we have in words. 
Um, and then there are some other skills that are somewhat related to this, but, but also slightly different. And what's interesting about these three skills, and I'm going to show you how we measure them, is that they all, if you give these tests in beginning readers, they're all strong predictors of children's later reading outcome. And they all make an independent contribution. So when you combine them, you can really estimate who will be a good reader down the road as opposed to who might be at risk for having a reading problem down the road. So here's just one example of a test that we use. There are many others. This is uh, a test where you associate sounds with colored blocks that you put in front of the person whose uh, phonemic awareness skills you're measuring. And you do things like this. Uh, show, if this says F, and you're representing two phonemes, show me if. And what you're looking for is for the person to take off the first block and replace it with another block to indicate that you've just uh, changed the first sound. And measures like this are very good at um, predicting later reading outcome. Another measure that is a good predictor of later reading outcome is the, this test. It's called the Rapid Automatized Naming Test, and it was devised by uh, Martha Denkler and Rita Riddell. And you first make sure that children or whoever you're testing, they know the, the letters that you have here. But then you ask them to say them as fast as they can. And the speed at which they do this is highly predictive of children's later reading outcome. And it's also a, an area where, just like the previous tests I showed you, children with dyslexia have difficulties with. And then the third test that we give is this one, which is a measure of working memory. This is a digit span. It's a subtest from an IQ test. And it's really the same thing that you do when you're trying to memorize somebody's telephone number, where you, um, somebody says to you, I'm going to say a number, uh, several numbers, and I want you to tell them back. And then at some po point in the test, it gets even harder, where they say, I'm going to tell you some numbers, and I want you to say them back to me, but in the reverse order. So you have to put them online in your working memory. And what we did is we measured these are all standardized tests, and we measured this in our participants, and then asked where do we see positive correlations in the brain between these measures and the brain activity. And so for a working memory, we see it in left parietal cortex. Uh, and for phonemic awareness at, this, at the phoneme level, we see a correlation in the top of the temporal area here in the back and in the inferior frontal gyrus. And the rapid naming uh, uh, is in red here. We see correlations also in the inferior frontal gyrus, but it behaves somewhat differently uh, in that it correlates with errors in the right hemisphere. And it's very interesting because in dyslexia research, not only do we know that these um, are, are different between children with and without dyslexia, but, but the children who have difficulties with both rapid naming and phonemic manipulations are the children who tend to be the most severe cases of dyslexia, and that's known as the double deficit um, uh, group. So what we've shown here is that you can see brain bases for reading early on in children. The areas that they use are also the same areas that we know are, are, are correlated uh, with skills that we know predict later reading outcome. Uh, and so this is also a way for us to bring together um, clinical tests or tests that are also used uh, in the testing environment at school with the brain imaging data as a way to fuse that because you can't do everything inside the scanner. There's only so much time that you have inside the scanner or so much time that you can uh, ask your participants to be in the scanner. So it's another way of tapping into some additional skills that you might be interested in. And so what I've shown you here our results that give you a sense of what happens in children and adults. And since then, people, of course, have done many of these studies. And here's a meta-analysis that was just published earlier this year from the Salzburg group showing brain activity in children and tasks that involve reading, and brain activity here in blue in adults, and some of the differences uh, between them. And they also, again, speak to these developmental changes, the idea that children more than adults engage these superior temp temporal portions, uh, that, and that in adults you see more activity in the frontal lobes, uh, and also in this area, in the visual word form area, perhaps with the idea that as you become more skilled and more automated, that you rely on, on very automatic recognition in this part of the visual stream. And people have also done studies looking at different languages where we know that the mapping between uh, the spoken language and print is somewhat different. So this is a very interesting study that was done some time ago by Raldo Palaiso, first of all showing areas involved in reading that are common to Italian readers and, uh, and uh, readers uh, in English in England, but also looking at differences and finding that the Italians where the mapping is much more consistent and where you can, you can apply sound correspondence rules quite easily because they always uh, follow, they use uh, 
temporal lobe areas up here in the superior portion of the temporal lobe, whereas in uh, English you rely heavily, more heavily on the visual area, the one that you use for, for um, recognizing the word by sight, as well as some of these frontal areas. So even though and there are many, many commonalities when people talk about universal features of reading. There are some differences depending on the kind of uh, language that you're reading and, and also uh, the orthography in which you read. So here is a meta-analysis now showing you the brains at a slightly different angle. This is an axial section looking at people who either read in an alphabetic language like uh, Italian and English. But now here uh, is the same data for people who are reading in, in Asian uh, writing systems, logographic languages. And what people have been struck by is the use of the left hemisphere uh, visual system in alphabetic writing systems. But this becomes either bilateral or maybe even more right hemisphere when it comes to reading these characters that have very, a lot of information that's visuospatial, has all these strokes, and, and would make sense that it would maybe invoke more right hemisphere function, given that the right hemisphere is more assigned to spatial um, analysis. And so again, you have to just remember that in, in much of this, we think of the brain as uh, having to tackle this rather complex skill and, and deciding what resources it can use, or as Stan Dehain described, that this in his neuronal recycling hypothesis is that you take brain areas that were doing something different but similar enough and you train them to become involved in this reading network of the brain and depending on what the demands are of the writing system in which you're learning to read they may be somewhat different even though in large part they're shared. And then I just want to mention another thing that's become very interesting in the last few years which is that when you learn to read uh, it seems that the act of doing that changes the brain quite dramatically. And this became very evident in these studies that were done in Colombia, comparing people who are illiterate, who've never learned to read, with those who used to be illiterate, but then later on as adults learned to read, and comparing the brain anatomy between them. So this is a measure of gray matter, gray matter volume. And what you're looking at here are areas in the brain where there's more volume, more brain volume in people who as adults learn to read. This was done in people who were engaged in guerrilla warfare and then later on as adults learn to read. And what you see is that the act of learning to read uh, increased gray matter volume in their brains. Uh, and that has very important uh, implications when we think about reading and reading disability. And here's sort of a very complicated slide, but I just want to give you the gist of this. This is sort of a, a study looking, at, in this case, at brain function from the work of Stan Dehane and looking at how people respond to different stimuli and using a range of participants that range all the way from being illiterate uh, and those who were illiterate and then became literate uh, to those uh, who are very fl fluid uh, readers. And so what you see here essentially is that as your brain responds more to, to words, um, you do that, obviously, the more skilled you are, the more literate you are. But if you uh, look at things like faces, those, uh, the same brain area now responds to faces if you are illiterate. So the idea here is that maybe areas that were engaged uh, pre before we became skilled readers for faces now get hijacked and get reassigned to processing this kind of object class, which is words, because it's important to us. And by doing so, we are essentially rearranging the functional specialization, in, in this case, of the visual um, stream. So let me turn to dyslexia now, which has been the focus uh, of our interest. And first of all, let me just tell you what dyslexia is. I'm going to show you three slides with the official definition that, that came out of the uh, a panel uh, from the International Dyslexia Organization, and it was uh, supported by the National Institute of Health. And really, when we talk about dyslexia, we're talking about children who, from the very beginning, are struggling readers and who have difficulty uh, in reading accuracy and the accuracy of words. It is the most common learning disability of all learning disabilities, and we know that it's uh, neurobiological in origin. They often have difficulties also with spelling, but the real, the real problem is decoding. Some countries emphasize the spelling. So for example, in Germany, the spelling is a, an important uh, em is emphasized when you talk about dyslexia. And the idea here is that the reason they struggle to learn to read is because of their difficulties with phonological processing. So even before learning to read, understanding that words are made up of sounds, that even though we 
we squeeze them, we co-articulate them, we make them all uh, sound like they're all connected, they are actually somewhat, they have to be disconnected for us to map them onto print. <coughs> and that children with dyslexia have difficulties with recognizing that, and that these difficulties are really quite unexpected because they're doing so, they're doing just fine in other areas of learning and cognition. And then the secondary consequence of this decoding problem is that they also then often have difficulties with comprehension. But their comprehension problems are really driven by their decoding problems. Um, because when you ask them to comprehend uh, through the oral modality, they don't have difficulties there. Um, and of course, uh, they also have reduced reading experience. And by doing that, you also then reduce their uh, background knowledge and growth of vocabulary and sight word vocabulary. Dyslexia is highly heritable, so if you have dyslexia, the chances that your child has dyslexia are about 40%. So we know who's at risk for having dyslexia based on their family history and also based on how well they do on these measures of phonological processing even before they go into school. Uh, it's highly prevalent. It, the actual rate depends on how you define it. Uh, it also is, is somewhat higher in English-speaking countries, but possibly because of the mapping in English. Uh, and, it's, and you see it more in males than you see in females. We know that there's a biological basis, and we've known that for some time, because uh, this is the very early work by Al Galaberta showing in, in brains of uh, individuals who had dyslexia during their lifetime, when examined at post-mortem, they found these ectopias that are indicative of some early uh, neuronal uh, differences in migration that happen in utero uh, when the brain was developing. And this was very important uh, for people to recognize that this really had a brain basis, and it wasn't because the children uh, weren't trying or were, were stupid or the parents were being difficult, but really showing that in areas that we know that are involved in language, there seemed to be, uh, at the microscopic level, some differences. And so when people started having brain imaging uh, technology, of course, they looked to ask questions, well, what are the areas that we see that are engaged in reading uh, in people who have no difficulties in learning to read, and how do they differ in children and adults with dyslexia? And largely what people have found is that areas in this occipital temporal portion and parietal uh, temporal areas are underactivated in people with dyslexia, even if they're engaged in the task. And you can see this uh, summarized here. This is a meta-analysis out of our lab showing that across a range of published studies, if you look at where the, you see the most um, salient findings across studies, they boil down to these areas, this extra stripe visual area, top of the temporal lobe and inferior parietal cortex. Um, and so it's really quite striking that independent of which lab or which country the work is done, that you see these common findings in these meta-analyses. And here again is an example looking at cross-linguistic studies. This is again from Erado Palaiso showing underactivity in the occipital temporal portion here in people with dyslexia in France and in Italy and in the United Kingdom. So even though they're all reading in different languages, uh, when they're engaged in reading in their language, they, they underactivate this part of the brain. And so, of course, one of the important questions is, what happens, first of all, you know, can, we, can, can people with dyslexia become more skilled readers? And if they do, what happens in the brain? What is the neural correlate of successful reading intervention? And that's a question that we asked a few years ago. And we studied a, a, a group of adults uh, doing a task. This is a slightly different task. We had people listening to words and taking off the first sound of that word or the first phoneme and saying it back to us. And here are adults who are typical readers, and when they're doing this task, they largely uh, activate the same areas that I've been showing you all along for reading uh, in this left hemisphere reading network. And here's a group of adults with dyslexia who we know have had dyslexia since they were children uh, doing the same task. And then we have to do a direct comparison between the two. And what we find is that in the adults with dyslexia, we see less activity in parietal cortex for this particular task. And remember, this is not a task where they're um, reading so much, but it's that they're hearing a word and they're manipulating the phoneme. And so what we then asked in these adults is what happens if they undergo a reading intervention and they make gains in reading. So the idea would be we scan them before the intervention, following the intervention, and then compare those two to see what changed. 
And the expectation may be that they now engage areas that we see in typical readers, and that by the time the intervention is over, they look more like a non-dyslexic reader. But it could also be that they use other areas that help them compensate for their reading difficulties. So kind of more the model that you see sometimes in stroke patients, where you see compensation in other brain areas. And we did this in the context of giving an intervention um, to these adults. We had 20 adults. Uh, we used an intervention for which we could find in the peer-reviewed published literature evidence that it worked. Um, and it's a, it's a combination of approaches, and it's, there's a lot going on in these interventions. But our goal was really to see not so much which aspects of the intervention worked, but, but could we um, improve on their reading. And the dyslexics that we saw uh, came from North Carolina. They were seen by, seen by June Orton, who's a very famous clinician, or was a very famous clinician in the, in the field of dyslexia. Her husband was Samuel Orton, who was a, a lead uh, person in dyslexia and, identify, and recognizing the biological basis for dyslexia. And uh, June Orton would keep records of the children that she saw. And those records were um, retrieved by the Wake Forest um, investigators in the 80s before HIPAA uh, from Columbia University, where, 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 um, um, where Dr. Orton had a faculty appointment. And so these are adults who we know that have had lifelong reading problems. And we assigned them into, into one of two groups. One group received the intervention, and the other group did not receive the intervention. But they could have the intervention afterwards if they wanted to. And that was to have a control group. And so the differences that we're looking at are now all in comparison to the, they're both dyslexic uh, groups, but only one group received the intervention. And the very first thing that we look at is what, what, what happened to their skills. So on, again, using standardized tests, we ask things like, well, did they get better at things like phonemic awareness, you know, manipulating sounds within words? Tests like, say, blend, now say it again without the uh sound. And on a task like that, we see marked improvement in the group of dyslexics who um, received the intervention, and statistically more than those that did not receive the intervention. We also had them do tasks that look at uh, symbol imagery or visual imagery, or making a, a, a seeing in your mind's eye the words that you're processing. And, and again, there they made um, significant gains. And the reason we're interested in these measures is because this is what the intervention really targets. And of course, you would expect to see changes here, because that's what they're doing during the intervention. The real question, question is, does it generalize to reading? And so here are some measures of uh, non-word reading, uh, where you, know, you have to decode the word because it's a word that you've never seen before. So the only way you can read it correctly is by sounding it out. And again, you can see that the dyslexics who received the intervention made significant gains. So uh, the intervention worked. And so now the question is, what happened in the brain? And what you're looking at here is the result from the increases following the reading intervention in the dyslexic group that received the intervention, but by comparison with the dyslexic group that did not receive the intervention. So it's a control design. And the first thing you'll notice is that there's an increase in parietal cortex, the area that I showed you before that was actually underactivated in the dyslexics compared to the non-dyslexics. And also activity now greater in this frontal area that we know that's involved. But what's so, somewhat striking is all this activity here in the right hemisphere that really speaks to a compensatory mechanism. So another area that got involved to help out, perhaps. Uh, and these are areas that, if they were in the left hemisphere, we'd, we would think about them as being involved in reading. But in the group of adults here, and these are people in their 40s and 50s, we see them in the right hemisphere. So there's a sort of a compensation model here. So from this, we, we um, uh, learned that we see increases in activity in both the left and the right hemisphere, and that in adults, and it turns out also in children, we see these um, right hemisphere increases that seem to indicate that other parts of the brain can be roped into reading, particularly uh, when reading acquisition is somewhat difficult. So I've shown you changes in, in, in brain function. But we were also interested in seeing whether there were, whether you can measure differences in brain structure when, when um, people with dyslexia undergo this kind of intensive tutoring. And the reason we were interested in it is because people have shown in our field that, uh, in, in the field of cognitive neuroscience, that when you train on certain skills, you can actually uh, show that not only do people get better at the task, but areas of the brain change in terms of gray matter volume. And this was a study that was done where college students learned to uh, juggle balls. And as they did so, uh, certain areas of cortex that are involved in visual motion processing 
uh, plumped up and got bigger, and then when they stopped, they shrank again. And so this paper um, received a lot of attention. Of course, it becomes much more meaningful in the context of learning. And here's now a, sim a study by the same authors, but this time looking at medical students who are studying for their medical exams, and where, again, you see uh, increases in brain structure Brain, gray matter volume, and this time they're actually maintaining uh, the gray matter volume, which is good because these are medical students and you hope that they, it sticks a little bit. Uh, and we wanted to ask a similar question in our dyslexic students. And so this is now a study that was done in children where we did intervention and asked, do we see gray matter volume changes in our dyslexic students who are undergoing the same kind of tutoring that I just described to you um, earlier for the adults, which is a tutoring with, um, you know, in small groups, uh, really it's sort of enhancing their understanding for phonemes uh, and so on, the kinds of things that people uh, typically provide for students with dyslexia. And we had a subset of children with dyslexia who we scanned and then they received a reading intervention, again the tutoring, after which they were scanned, and then we also rescanned them after the same amount of time to have a no intervention uh, period. And that sort of fit the same design as the ones that I've just shown you, uh, in that you can now see whether they maintain any gains um, and whether they maintain any changes in, in brain uh, anatomy that may have come about by the reading intervention in the first place. And so first of all, let me just show you what happens to reading. And these are all standardized measures of reading in the solid bars that you can see go up from uh, before the intervention began to after the intervention was completed. And all the dotted lines are measures of skills that we know that support reading, things like phonemic awareness, rapid naming, working memory. And you can also see that after the intervention was over, and we saw them again for the third time, they, they maintained all their um, skills. So it didn't go away. And of course, it's reading, so it's not that they stop reading, they continue to read, and so they maintain uh, the, the gains. And this is what we saw in four brain areas that um, increased in gray matter volume as a result of the intervention. You can see them going up, and you can see that they um, maintained and even continued going up even when we no longer provided the intervention. And here's where these areas are. They're in the left and right hippocampus. And we thought this was somewhat interesting because we were actually rooting for the areas that we see an activity in during the functional task and, and, and those areas that we know that are involved in phonological processing. But instead, what we found is, is areas that are involved in, in learning and memory and have also been shown to change in other studies that, in, that include um, skill acquisition, as well as the cerebellum and um, the left precuneus. So what we learned from this is that not only do we see changes in brain in behavior and improvement in reading, I showed you in the earlier study that we look at uh, differences in brain function, but here what we see in terms of structure, um, that happens in other areas, and it's sort of interesting that it's in the hippocampus, which is one of the areas where people suspect there may be some generation um, of, of new uh, tissue, and, and that could be uh, the reason why the hippocampus is involved. And importantly, these differences are maintained rather than just going away. So um, based on that, it may now dawn on you that I've just shown you that when uh, children learn to read, their brain changes. And when children with dyslexia undergo tutoring and make gains, uh, their brain changes. And I've already pointed out to you that learning to read changes the brain. And this actually now presents a little bit of a dilemma for us in research, because when we look at the brains of people with dyslexia, it's a little hard to know whether the differences that we see are due to their, their dyslexia, or if they're more a reflection of the difference of their reading experience compared to the other children to which we compare them. So you, know, you have to remember that children who go to school and learn to read, essentially their brains, we think, are changing because of that process. Then we take children with dyslexia who haven't enjoyed that same reading experience because they're struggling, and now we're comparing them um, to that population, and we may see differences. And in fact, we do. Here's another meta-analysis uh, from the Salzburg group by Fabio Richland. These are areas uh, where people most commonly report an anatomical difference, the same anatomy that I've been describing in gray matter volume in studies of, of dyslexics compared to non-dyslexics, where they see less gray matter volume in these uh, structures here in the temporal lobe. Um, but the question is, is this why they struggle to learn to read, or is this the consequence of their altered reading experience? And so to ask that question, we um, took a slightly different approach, which is to not just compare our dyslexic children to their peers who are matched on age, 
but to compare them to children um, who are younger but reading at the same level, so they're matched on reading level. Um, and that's what's demonstrated here. So this is sort of the traditional design. You compare your dyslexic to your non-dyslexic children. They're matched on age. But now you take younger children who are equated to the dyslexic group on their reading level, even though um, they, are, they are actually older. And when we compare our children with dyslexia to their chronological age-matched comparison group, we find differences in gray matter volume in the right hemisphere uh, also, but also in these left hemisphere regions that have previously been reported. But when we repeat it in the children who are younger and matched on uh, reading level, we can't reproduce the result. It goes away. Uh, only one finding is maintained, and that's in this right hemisphere. So, so that really does suggest that maybe part of what we're seeing here has to do with the reading experience itself rather than the dyslexia. And of course, that's going to be very important in terms of our understanding of the etiology in dyslexia and the brain mechanisms. Um, if we can't uh, reproduce um, it in these reading level match designs, and of course, we need longitudinal studies to really be certain also what's going on. But from this, we deduce that we have to be somewhat cautious about interpreting these differences in gray matter volume. Um, and also, um, we are somewhat struck by this right hemisphere difference, which is the only one that seems to uh, maintain across the two experiments. So we have to think about not only what do we, does the brain bring to the process of reading to become a skilled reader, but the experience of engaging with books and texts on, on a regular basis, how does that change the brain? So we have really have to think of it as a, as a two-way street. And we know that because we know, as I showed you early on, that as you become more skilled as a reader, the areas that you use uh, increase and change. And since we're sort of on the topic of uh, areas of study that you know, make us uh, pause a little bit about our understanding of dyslexia and how to interpret the findings, um, I want to introduce this idea, and I know people here are very interested in this, is the role of sex. And I told you that dyslexia is, is more commonly found in males than it is in females. But in reality, most of the work has also been done on males, and we don't know very much about females. And so um, here's a, another meta-analysis, this time by another group, looking at nine studies that were done and in, in, in published, looking at published studies in dyslexia and seeing what are the, the areas that uh, come up again and again as being different. I'm showing you the same areas as I showed you in the previous study, plus some additional ones. But these are nine studies. But when you look at the studies that, that fed into this meta-analysis, uh, the dyslexics, uh, only 16% of them are females. The majority of them are males, because the original studies are all done in all male samples or male-dominated samples. And so what does that mean for, for females with dyslexia? So my uh, graduate student, Tanya uh, Evans, looked into this. And I, I don't expect you to, to be able to read this, but the point I really just want to make here is that we studied um, men with dyslexia and compared them to men who don't have dyslexia, and women with dyslexia and compared them to only women in dyslexia. And that hadn't actually been done before because nobody has just looked at females. And then we did the same in a group of children, again, just boys uh, with and without dyslexia and girls with and without dyslexia. And what we found is, uh, is summarized here, in the, and what we found is that in boys, for example, or in men, we see differences in the temporal lobe, like I described to you before. In the boys, we see differences in the left hemisphere, um, angular gyrus, supramarginal gyrus. But when it comes to the women, the differences were in the right hemisphere. They were, they were around the central sulcus. In the girls, too, and the girls also, we saw differences in early visual system. And so they don't, just don't map onto the literature at all. And so I think it's really critical that we start studying uh, females separately when it comes to dyslexia and probably other disorders. And we were also struck by this finding that was published by um, Simon Baron Cohen and his colleagues showing the relationship between testosterone levels in utero on later gray matter volume and showing that there are negative correlations in these temporal lobe areas where we see differences in dyslexia in males and positive correlations uh, in these other areas. So the idea that the early uterine environment and these hormones uh, may play an important role in how uh, the brain develops. And we already know that there are very um, striking differences between 
men and women when it comes to brain structure. Um, people have studied that quite extensively. And we also know that when it comes to uh, language function, also we see some differences in brain, how the brain is organized uh, for language tasks, particularly tasks that are critical to reading, like phonological processing has been shown uh, in one study to be uh, represented bilaterally in women, but unilaterally in, in men. And uh, so clearly, there are differences to begin with. And then if you, if you on top of that, put dyslexia, you're likely to see some sex-specific differences. And of course, it's also very interesting when you contemplate this in the context of what we know about the, the, the role of sex hormones in neural injury um, and, and how it may be, um, play a different role in, in women and also in the outcome of dyslexia. So uh, really, my point here is, is to say, I think people are beginning to re recognize now that we really have to study females with dyslexia separately. And there are two other papers that just came out recently, also again showing that some of the differences that you see in the dyslexic brains of males with dyslexia are not the same as what you see in females. So um, I, I urge you to you know, pull your, your data apart. So from my talk now, you've sort of gotten the sense of the sort of interest in dyslexia on phonological processing. People refer to the phonological deficit hypothesis here, or theory, that there are differences in the left hemisphere that we think that they impact phonological processing and that they are the reason why children with dyslexia struggle to learn to read. This is really one of the most prevalent theories and, and, and when children uh, need help for reading, people do try and address their phonological deficits primarily. But I should let you know that there, there are other manifestations of dyslexia and there are other theories about what may be the cause of dyslexia. And another one is this one, which is this magnocellular deficit hypothesis, which spans across the auditory system and the visual system, as well as the motor system. And the idea here is that there are some impairments uh, in these systems that result uh, in a number of uh, behavioral manifestations. One, for example, difficulties in auditory processing, and that these um, directly are, uh, are related to these phonological processing problems that children with dyslexia have, so kind of a low level uh, etiology that then percolates up to these phonological problems that then impact the reading problem. As part of this kind of a larger magnocellular deficit hypothesis, uh, there's been some work looking at the visual system. And I want to um, use that as an example uh, to show you how I think brain imaging can help in clearing up some of these really what are competing theories about the etiology of dyslexia. So I'm now going to orient you to the visual system. And the magnocellular theory is, is based on observations in uh, behavior of children when they have to process visual tasks. Uh, and the, the differences that you see in children with dyslexia seem to be on visual tasks that are thought to be processed by what's called the magnocellular system, which is a division of the visual system that begins actually as early as at the eyeball, the retinal ganglion cells, but is noticeable in the thalamus, uh, but then is, uh, projects into different streams with the magnocellular system uh, often being sort of uh, thought of as the dorsal stream um, and uh, as opposed to the ventral stream, which is more interested in, in object processing. The dorsal stream is engaged in visual motion perception, area V5MT sits here, helps us identify where things are moving in space. And, and generally, uh, this part of the brain is thought of as a spatial and spatial um, orient orienting uh, of the brain. And so what was interesting is that many years ago, there were studies l using visual psychophysics showing that there are differences in children with dyslexia when it comes to processing uh, stimuli of low spatial and high temporal frequency, which are attributes that are thought to be subserved by the magnocellular visual system. And uh, later, people built on this by looking at visual motion uh, detection, because th that's thought to be part of the, this magnocellular stream. And it's showing very simply that when you ask children to look at dots and ask them to see what direction they're moving in, children with dyslexia need to have more dots moving in that direction before they can detect what the direction is compared to children who don't have dyslexia. And it seemed to fit quite well with other work. So for example, we published some findings showing that if you put people into the scanner and they process motion, you see activity in this part of the brain. This is called V5MT. It's, it's sort of a grape-sized area that helps us uh, process visual motion. 
And in the and the and this and the in the dyslexics, we did not see activity in this part of the brain. So really, the, these the sort of behavioral work seemed to have a neurological basis in in the functional studies, and it was very specific to the stimuli because we didn't see it, for example, in response to patterns where the responses were very similar between our uh, dyslexic and non-dyslexic sample, and it fit very nicely with anatomical work that again was done in postmortem um, by the uh, by the group in Boston, showing that if you look at the thalamus and you look at the, neuro the cells and the magnocellular layers, you see a difference in between the dyslexic and the non-dyslexic tissue, but you don't when you look at other parts of the same structure. So it all seemed to sort of fit. Um, the only thing that's problematic is in part to understand how does this impact reading? How does the visual motion system or the, the system that deals with these fine um, uh, visual attributes, how does it in impact reading? And so it's, it's, uh, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a somewhat controversial, controversial theory. Some people saying, you know, it's just, it doesn't exist. It's not the cause of the reading problem. Others have argued that it, it really does contribute to reading problems because it's involved in eye movement, and uh, accurate eye movement is important in accurately seeing the, the letters and the words that you see. Um, and others have suggested that maybe it's an epiphenomena of dyslexia, that it coexists, perhaps because whatever changes in the brains of people with dyslexia um, leads to secondary changes in uh, the visual system and then manifests as things that we, that we can see and test in the laboratory. Uh, but how they actually impair reading isn't clear. More likely, it's the phonological problem that impairs reading, but we measure these in the laboratory. Um, and what, what we are now arguing is that perhaps what we're seeing is really a consequence of not having the same reading experience with, if you have dyslexia compared to the peers by which you com compare you, them to. And so just to make that point, what I'm showing you here is here's the activity in this area V5MT, and this is in a group of uh, typical readers. And the amount of signal that you see when they're looking at dots that are moving and detecting the direction the amount of signal that you see here is directly correlated with their performance on reading on a standardized uh, s scale, which is sort of surprising. I mean, why would this part of the brain be related to your reading ability? And this is for real word reading, uh, and, and uh, we see it in both, and this is for non-word reading, and we see it both in the left and right hemisphere. And it's this sort of a finding that's been so compelling to say, look, there's a, there's a relationship between these two. But of course, a correlation doesn't mean causation. And so to get at the is issue of causation, we again went to this idea of a reading level match design, where, as uh, proposed by Oshoka Swami, you have to show that the deficit is not just there in children with dyslexia when compared to their chronological age matched peers, but also in children who are younger but l at the same level of reading. And so that's, that's exactly what we did, just like we did before, uh, but this time we did it in the context of looking at activity in this area, V5MT, this visual motion area that's here at the back of the brain, and showing that in both the left and the right side of the brain, when we compared dyslexics and non-dyslexics matched on age, we see these differences, just like we had in the adults. But now, when we instead compare the dyslexics with children who are younger and reading at the same level, the difference disappears. So that really gives you the sense that maybe it's not the cause, but it's, it follows uh, not learning to read quite as much. And so we then followed this with another uh, study, which is we looked at what happens following an intervention. And typically in studies, um, the reason why the sort of a phonological deficit hypothesis uh, is well accepted is because not only do you see the differences in the children with dyslexia, and not only do you see that in typical children, phonological skills predict later reading outcome, but when you provide a phonological intervention, you often see gains in reading, and they generalize to reading, just as I showed you before. Now, in this case, we didn't do an intervention on visual motion perception. We did a, an intervention on phonological processing, and we asked what happens in this area in the visual system following the intervention. And again, I'm showing you here activity from both the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And this is a change score, again, from comparing before the intervention with after the intervention. And so what you see here is that in our children with dyslexia, there was a significant increase in the signal in response to visual motion perception in the right hemisphere. The, the increase was also there, but not statistically significant in the left hemisphere. So as they un underwent intervention and as their reading improved, their visual motion system went up a notch. And it's specific because when, at a time when they received 
either no intervention or a math intervention, which was sort of our control, we didn't see any such changes. So it's not because they were scanned twice or something else, but under very controlled circumstances, you see this, this change. So what that really tells you is, yes, there is a relationship between visual motion perception, uh, or in this case, a relationship with the activity in the brain area that we uh, know subserves visual motion perception and reading. But when you look at the reading level match design, it suggests that it doesn't hold up when you look at, at children who are matched on reading. Uh, and also, when the dyslexic children become more skilled at reading, uh, we see this increase. And actually, there is behavioral work um, that's, that's um, consistent with this and has people thinking that perhaps learning to read mobilizes some of these uh, areas in the, in the visual system. And it's also been shown that people who are uh, illiterate uh, do process visual information somewhat differently from those who are illiterate. So again, it's this idea of what happens when we learn to read that changes the brain um, in ways perhaps much more far-fetching than, than one might uh, imagine. So I just want to, in the last few minutes, turn to a slightly uh, different area that we started to become interested in. But again, it goes back to why uh, the, the phonological problems uh, and the language problems in dyslexia uh, are so interesting. And that is uh, the area of arithmetic. Uh, because uh, arithmetic, uh, like reading, uh, is something that the children learn in school. Um, and again, there's this idea of what are the brain areas that we use to do arithmetic. And again, in our culture, be being good at math is really very important, just like it's very important to become good at reading. Now, many of you know that there is uh, what's called high comorbidity between dyslexia and dyscalculia. So you see math difficulties in children with dyslexia more often than you see in non-dyslexic children, suggesting that perhaps they hang together. And it's been suggested that the same phonological awareness difficulties that hamper with children's reading problems and dyslexia may also be important to some, but not all, arithmetic problems. And it's the kind of arithmetic that involves retrieving things from memory, the kind of these left hemisphere retrieval mechanisms that we use for doing small number addition and multiplication. So when you add numbers or multiply small numbers, you do it by retrieving it from, from memory. Um, and it's thought that maybe your phonological processing is important for that. And people have also shown in neuroimaging, uh, as in this study by uh, Prado and Booth and others, is that when you do this kind of retrieval-based arithmetic, you engage areas in the left hemisphere in the same regions that are active when you're doing a phonological uh, task. And so here's some evidence for this correlation between phonological awareness. This is a measure of phoneme elision, so deleting sounds within words, and uh, this kind of retrieval-based arithmetic, so for example, doing 4 plus 5 equals 9. If you do a, uh, a procedural kind of arithmetic, such as subtraction, you don't see this relationship with phonological awareness. It's very specific for this kind of retrieval-based arithmetic. And so we ask the question, well, what does that mean for children who have dyslexia, even though they don't um, have uh, math dis difficulties, certainly not on standardized tests of math, and not enough that they meet the clinical criteria. So uh, I, I'm not going to go through the details of the slide, but really what I just want to show you is that these are children with dyslexia identified based on their reading difficulties compared to children who don't have dyslexia. Uh, and in fact, on standardized tests of calculation, uh, do fairly well and, and are actually matched to our sample of, of uh, controls. But these measures don't pull apart this sort of fine level uh, that I just described in terms of looking at tasks that involve retrieval-based arithmetic, like addition and multiplication, versus subtraction. And so what we did here is we essentially had our children uh, perform these kinds of uh, small number arithmetic tasks that we think tap into retrieval-based arithmetic. And then we also had them perform these more procedural-based operations that are thought to be more involving of the right hemisphere as opposed to the left hemisphere. And we scanned the children with and without dyslexia. And what we found is that even though the children with dyslexia do not have a math disability based on sort of standard um, identification, we see underactivity in the children with dyslexia 
when they're doing these math tasks in the left hemisphere, this is in the left uh, supermarginal gyrus. So in the same area that we know that's involved in reading and phonological manipulation, when you look at the, both these kinds of arithmetic tasks, you see underactivity in the children with dyslexia compared to the non-dyslexic controls. And then what's interesting is that we see that in the right hemisphere, um, there are also some differences. So typical um, readers use the right hemisphere for this task that involves um, subtraction. So I think of subtraction as the right hemisphere task, but they wouldn't engage um, it so much for addition because that's more a left hemisphere task. But the children with dyslexia don't show this dissociation. They are trying to use the right hemisphere for the addition task, which is not the right strategy. Uh, but at the same time, they're not able to access the right hemisphere as effectively for doing the subtraction task the way the typical children do. And this fits very, very well with the behavioral data uh, that has shown these differences in these different kinds of tasks. Again, really making the point that even though dyslexia, by definition, is a uh, reading problem, it's probably much more uh, than that because some of the same underlying difficulties that contribute to their reading problems also subtly, in a very subtle way, contribute to some of their math uh, problems. And it's sort of interesting to use brain imaging to show that they really actually are in the same areas of the brain, whether you're doing a phonological task or a reading task or actually even, a, as I've shown you here, an arithmetic task. So let me just sort of summarize what I've told you in the last hour, which is that we, you know, we and others, many others now have uh, utilized brain imaging as a way to understand uh, how the brain is organized for reading, what are the earliest areas that become engaged, and, and we know that, of course, uh, there are differences between skilled and, and novice readers, um, and we also know that there are differences between children who are struggling readers because of their dyslexia and adults also, and we know uh, that they very reliably are in these areas that I've shown you in left um, parietal temporal and occipital temporal, uh, as well as um, uh, 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 sort of other uh, areas that I've shown you in these slides, but mainly in these areas in the left hemisphere. Um, and that when uh, reading, success, reading intervention is successful and they are able to make um, substantial gains in reading, we see changes in both brain activity uh, and in brain anatomy. They don't necessarily co-localize to the same brain areas, and I think that's very indicative, perhaps, of us being able to understand what happens during these interventions, why these areas, and, and uh, what, is, what is the mechanism. Um, and I think I've also shown you that we're beginning to become more cautious in terms of how we interpret these brain images, because when we see differences in the brains of people with and without dyslexia, we, we, we're not, we can't be certain, uh, and, and we still need to pull apart how much of this is due to their dyslexia um, uh, to begin with versus their very different experience that they've had, particularly for adults who have, have a lifelong experience that is quite different from uh, those who don't have dyslexia. And that there are, of course, many things that we have to take into consideration, but particularly sex, because it may be that the, that the brain-based model for dyslexia in females uh, may turn out to be somewhat different than it is uh, in males. And I just want to thank my collaborators who've um, uh, done this work, and, and I want to thank you for your attention and again for having me here. And you raise this issue that there's some overlap really fundamentally between the experience and uh, difficulties in reading and math. So I was wondering if you intervene with one, do you show improvement in the other area, whether it be behaviorally and or in a, a brain a functional or structural way? Yeah, I think that's a good question. And actually, uh, maybe you'll have me back in a few years because we are uh, going to start studying exactly that question going forward. You know, um, it's sort of very interesting that within arithmetic, there is this sort of um, specificity for some tasks to one hemis to one to some brain areas and others uh, uh, other tasks for others and so what we're trying to do uh, in the next few years for the new grant that we're getting from NIH is to ask the question because people have argued about whether the reason you see dyslexia and dyscalculia in the same children is because they have some common underlying cognitive shared difficulties or if they're separate and it's just the two of them coming together and there's some there's some discussion about that but what we're trying to do is is to do exactly what you're asking which is to say when you um, introduce a, a reading intervention that that 
in, increases your phonological awareness skills, shouldn't you then benefit from that in this particular aspect of arithmetic processing? And we don't know yet because nobody's actually done that yet. And, and the, the real problem uh, is, is really sort of a simple one, which is when you look at these standardized tests for, for math, as I mentioned earlier, they don't pull them apart in that way. So, so people have done work like Lynn Fuse and people like that in, in Texas where they come up with new tests that look at these constructs very di separately, whereas they're all sort of merged in these standardized tests that we use. And that's part of the reason we don't know. So we have measures of, uh, uh, of math performance and reading performance actually before, before both math and reading intervention, but we don't know, we can't tell if, if they influence math uh, in a differential way, the way I just described. I had a question regarding your research that showed that there's increased brain activity and gray matter volume with successful reading intervention. Um, is that correlated with the amount of improvement? So in other words, if children improve a lot with reading intervention, they have more increased um, gray matter volume compared to if they make a modest improvement? Yes. That, that's a very good question. In fact, we wondered the same, and I didn't show you the slide. Um, but in the, uh, in the study, we, we looked at exactly that. We said, you know, is there, if you look at the amount of change, or, you know, the degree of benefit from the intervention, and the amount of brain volume, is there a direct relationship? And we did find it. Again, not in the areas that we expected, because we really thought we would see these changes in these classical reading areas. Um, we saw it in areas such as the cerebellum, which actually there are a lot of people who are very interested in the role of the, cere of the cerebellum in, in reading. Um, you know, it's this uh, structure at the back of the brain where we did see the, the kind of correlation that you just described. So yes, it's there. Did it answer our question? No, it sort of un it opened new questions, which is why, why in those, those brain areas. And this question, might not be very interesting. But um, hyperlexia, you know, we see a lot of children here who have the ability to recognize the alphabet so early in life, even before they can talk, except for it to label it. Do you have thoughts about that? I, I do, and you know, I've, I've been regretting all day that I didn't include that in my talk. Um, because we did have, uh, as I uh, discussed with, with uh, students and postdocs and some faculty here today, we, we, had, we did a, a case report on hyperlexia. And it's a single case, but it's, it's very striking for the reasons that you just described, which is that these children are so striking. And, and really, they, uh, they really go sort of against what we think about and everything that I've just told you, which is to become a skilled reader, you have to good, have good oral language skills, and you have to have good instructions. And it's a task that doesn't come to us naturally. Yet here you have these children who, out of the blue and in the presence of delayed language, acquire spontaneously, it seems, um, um, very good decoding skills. Uh, and so we did do a study um, on a child um, who uh, we scanned when he was 10 years old who has, who was, uh, on the, um, has a, a diagnosis of PDD, not uh, NOS. And he uh, was a precocious reader. The first spoken words he had when he was three and a half um, but his mother had noticed long before then that he was reading because she would read to him at nighttime and she would put her finger under the words that she was reading and he would move them when he saw that she was not on the right word. So she knew he was reading long before he was um, talking. And so we asked exactly the question that I'm sure that you're asking, which is, which brain areas does he use for reading? And um, we did the same uh, experimental design where we compared him to children that were matched to him on chronological age. But of course, he's now doing the reading, his reading is at the other extreme, which is that he's reading well a above them. And so we also compared him to a group of uh, children who were 15 years of age, even though he was 10, to match on his reading ability, which was you know, around five or six years ahead of his age. And what we found is that he literally um, showed more activity 
uh, in both those um, comparisons in the left hemisphere, in the same sort of superior temporal areas uh, and inferior frontal areas that I showed you that people have been focusing on in dyslexia. So it's almost like these areas are sort of like a dial that they're underactivated in dyslexia, overactivated in hyperlexia. Now this is a single case report, and I think it's still the only uh, study, and we need more studies of these children because they are um, very interesting because uh, in the context of, of struggling readers, you want to know how are these children doing this and which other, what other brain areas are available to them. And when we did the study, we did it in the context of asking, is it a truly a left hemisphere advantage versus a right hemisphere advantage? Because some of the thinking about hyperlexia had been that these are children with heightened uh, kind of visual memory uh, skills and that they're recognizing the words, but they're sort of processing them as objects. Um, and, and we really had more evidence for the, the first, which is that they, um, that in this case, he was using left hemisphere regions. And this particular uh, child was also very good at phonological awareness skills. Uh, but of course, uh, as you know, they're not all the same. Um, and so we really need some more studies looking at that population. Um. When it comes to attention issues, um, for me, it's and for parents I counsel, it seems like another chicken and egg for in some people's mind, um, whether the attention issue might be causing difficulties in reading or the reading difficulty is causing an attention deficit because they're not as interested. Um, can you speak to that issue? Yes. So um, you may have noticed I didn't mention uh, ADHD or attention at all. and. Uh, uh, what, what we've done in our studies varies a little bit. So for some of our studies, we don't include children who have ADHD because um, you know, we worry that, that we want to, since we have small samples, we want to keep the, the sample as homogenous as possible. For some studies, we haven't done them and we have included them. And uh, to some degree, we say, well, you know, the areas that are uh, implicated in ADHD don't really uh, co-localize to the areas that we're interested in reading. Um, but your, your point is a, is a really good one, which is this problem that I think when you, you have a child who may look like they're not paying attention, but it's really because they're bored because all their peers are reading uh, and they can't participate in that process. So they start thinking of other things to do to entertain themselves and they look like they have an attention problems and, and vice versa. Um, uh, it, it, it requires, I think, a careful clinician to, to, to disambiguate those two so that you come up with the right treatment plan, because as you heard, the treatment plan in dyslexia is very much a, a one that involves tutoring, uh, very, making it very explicit. Uh, uh, you know, it, it involves teaching the same kinds of skills that you teach all children to learn to read, but it's really the intensity and the repetition and, and making it very, very explicit that is important and doing it in a smaller group, you know, one-on-one -on -one or small groups and uh, with many examples. And, you know, I think in, in the field, people also like to combine it with um, the, the kind of approach that I showed you, which involves visual imagery, but also involves multi-sensory intervention, so teaching phonemes, and not just through audition, but also the motor system and, you know, all those kinds of approaches. And uh, that's, of course, very different from, you know, treating a child with ADHD, where, of course, you also have behavioral, but also pharmacological interventions. So, so, so you really need a good uh, clinician to, to pull those two apart. Now, of course, you may have both in the same child, in which case you have to do both. Um, and so I'm not sure if your question is leading to this idea of could brain imaging, you know, help pull those apart. And I think a lot of people are very interested in whether we can use these brain scans, perhaps, as a better way of un identifying, you know, what, what actually is going on with the child. But as you saw, um, all the scans that we do are based on groups. And so everything that we do is based on group data interpretation. Now, there are efforts on the way to try and uh, use individual scans. And I did tell you, even though I didn't show you the data, I, I told you that we had a case report uh, on this child with hyperlexia. But you know, the, to, to the degree that people are comfortable making a diagnosis on a single person's brain scan, uh, we're just not quite there yet. Um, but it, that may change, and, and uh, hopefully it will change. And that's perhaps where um, you know, that kind of data could be, could be put together with a careful behavioral assessment. Uh, but but it's it's really critical, I think, to to tell those two apart, because you can lose so much time in the meantime. Uh, but again, I think you know if if you if you look at these phonological awareness skills and you look at them early on, you you and and you take the history into account, uh, it you should be able to distinguish them. 
So, Guinevere, it's a fascinating story you presented about the gray matter volumes increasing with your fMRI imaging after a reading intervention. So what do you think that increased volume represents? Is it more synapses or more larger neurons, more neurons, extracellular fluid, astrocytes, any ideas? So the short answer is, I don't know, and nor does anybody else. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of, uh, uh, there have been a lot of discussions about this. Uh, and you know, I, I'll be very honest with you, there are some scientists who really worry about these kinds of findings. In fact, there are some who are concerned that it may be more to do that, that what we're seeing here are, are changes uh, uh, that are somewhat uh, a side effect of the, the technology and the analysis of, of the data. Um, and so that's one extreme, to, to, that there are people that are concerned that when you scan people twice and you see a, a difference, it may be uh, kind of more of a methodological issue. But I think in areas where you have reasons to believe there could be such a biological change, there is more confidence, and the hippocampus is one of those areas, uh, because you know there is this is an area that's involved in neurogenesis, and so it actually sort of makes sense biologically. But nobody knows what these changes are. Um, and every paper that looks at changes in gray matter volume over time or even looking at people with particular skills, you know, there have been these studies looking at people who by profession do certain things that uh, create larger brain areas because they're musicians or taxi drivers or so on. Uh, every paper at the end of the discussion, you will find the standard text saying, you know, what, what the origin of this difference is, we just don't know. Um, it's something that, that is addressable. I mean, you can do these studies in animals, and, and, and you can get to the bottom of this, but nobody really knows what it is. Earlier, I read about a study in which it indicated that the people in countries that are using a visual system um, for reading, like in the Asian languages, that they have very few dyslexics because they're able to access the information both through the phonological system, because there's a part of the uh, characters that are telling you a phoneme, as well as a part that is telling you uh, an actual word, so they can utilize both parts of the brain. And so it kind of looked like that would make sense according to your graphing, because it showed that there was a lot of lit up in both sides of the brain when you were showing that part. I'm wondering then if it doesn't predispose those children also for learning arithmetic, because they would already be utilizing both sides of the brain uh, for, for reading. And so therefore, it would also assist them with mathematics. You know, I think that's a really interesting question, and, and there is some work to address exactly what you're asking. So uh, people have done studies looking at um, dyslexia in China, and the first study showed that the areas that are different between children with and without dyslexia in China are not exactly the same areas that have been shown in alphabetic writing systems. And the idea here is this idea, that exactly what you alluded to, which is when you, when you read uh, in a pictorial logographic writing system like that, you may use different brain areas. And so um, the finding there was that, that there were actually, um, it wasn't a direct comparison between alphabetic readers and logographic readers, but it was just showing the differences in the Chinese children and then you know, by comparison with the published literature, arguing that the areas are different. And the areas that have been in, uh, implicated in uh, reading in Chinese, there's particularly an area in the front uh, of the brain in Brahman's area nine that has been of interest because it seems to pop up in studies of reading in Chinese, but not so much in, in reading in alphabetic languages. And it's an area that could be involved in 
it's not quite clear if it's an error that brings together sort of semantics and phonology, uh, or if it's an error that's involved in the motor program that children would use to produce that Chinese character, because uh, children in China you know, spend a lot of time copying uh, these characters when they're learning to read. Uh, so there we're getting sort of into another part of the brain. Um, and it's a very strong predictor in China, in China is, is how good you are at copying Chinese characters is a strong predictor of later reading outcome. And so uh, that study seemed to suggest th this idea that dyslexia uh, may manifest somewhat differently, which sort of makes sense and would also be important for intervention because the kind of intervention that is practiced here may not be what's needed for children in China. And actually the same is true in um, even in other languages and within the alphabetic system. But since then, others have done studies, and there was a study by Kathy Price's group actually directly comparing uh, ch uh, children with and without dyslexia in, in alphabetic and logographic writing systems and not finding these kinds of differences. So I don't have a really good answer for you other than to say you know people are looking at it and the jury is, is out, and it's exactly for all the reasons that you just sort of summarized, which has to do with what areas do you use for reading, and then how does that also impact other skills? You mentioned arithmetic, um, and people, you know, have these case reports also for uh, children who uh, have dyslexia in one language but not in the other. There was a famous case report showing uh, of a boy who had dyslexia in English but not in Japanese, and again, it speaks to the the role of the writing system. So. It's, it still uh, needs some more studies, I think, to, to fully know. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.